The following podcast is brought to you by the Jonas Podcasting Network, found exclusively at WrestlingWithJonas.com. Hello again, wrestling fans, and welcome to another edition of This Week in History, where we take a look at the rich history of our great sport. I uh, want to thank you for watching uh, Thursday afternoon at YouTube or Facebook, listening to us on Stitcher, Spotify, Art Radio, or anywhere else you get your podcasts from. You can always get in touch with us by emailing scumbagswrestling at gmail.com, checking our website at scumbagswrestling.ca, or easiest way to get in touch with us is over at our Facebook page. Always available in that way. We also do have uh, Twitch, Twitter, and uh, Instagram. So we're available on uh, media wherever you're uh, looking to find us. We are doing the week in history, looking at November 19th to 25th. And we're getting closer to our revamp of the show because uh, we'll have a whole calendar year of these going back in time. So we're going to uh, give a little bit more in-depth uh, views of some of the things we looked at this past year. But we can't do any of that until we go over to Niagara Falls and bring in Jonesy. How are you? I'm doing pretty damn good. Uh, I was watching some of that uh, WWE A and E uh, show with them. I don't even know what it's called, but oh, the uh, vault stuff or yes. looking for the the uh, greatest treasures. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I never get to see that, and unfortunately, uh, I don't know if that's going to happen again because if they do, they're going to have to find another uh, host because the guy who was uh, doing it. Top Dalla just got uh, released a couple uh, week and a half ago from WD, so they'll have to find a new host if they're going to uh, redo that show for more treasures with A and E. But uh, yeah, I heard it was a decent show. You can uh, you can catch it on YouTube. A lot of it is on there. That uh, it's just not the full show, but it's tons of segments. So yeah. that's what I've been watching. There's nothing wrong with uh, segments, especially in this day and age of. Uh, Instant gratification and lack of attention spans, you can get little bits and pieces and be satisfied at the same time without having to go a whole show. But Absolutely. we're going to do a whole show here. We are. So hopefully people enjoy the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how we go. And we're going to hit this week in history, starting with November 19th. And 55 years ago in Omaha, Nebraska, Mad Dog Vachon defeated Dick the Bruiser to win the AWA World Heavyweight Championship for the fifth time. 31 years ago at a WWF Superstars taping, Mr. Perfect defeated the Texas Tornado, Kerry Von Erich, to win the WWF Intercontinental Championship for his second time. Yeah, I think I remember that episode of uh, Superstars. I was trying to get uh, other clips. It's just a shame that, uh, in a way, um, Kerry Von Erich didn't have a better run in WWE than he did. Um, of course, he was in the, the downward slide of his career, uh, considering he lost his foot and uh, all the personal demons he was dealing with. So I can only imagine what a Kerry Von Erich in his prime without those uh, ailments uh, restricting him, could have done in WWE. But, of course, he worked for his dad and everything down in Texas, so he didn't really have a lot of time to go out to New York and uh, make it big there. He was pretty entertaining, though. I thought Texas Tornado, to me, Texas Tornado re- kind of was like a ultimate warrior but on volume and smarter. Yeah, well, he was the modern day warrior as opposed, and it was he even had tassels. Of, pardon? He even had tassels. Yeah, and out of Survivor Series, you had the warriors all together because you had the Ultimate Warrior leading the modern day warrior and the Road Warriors all on one team. I did not put all that together. All right, 30 years ago, WCW presented Kasha the Champion 17. 
Steve Austin defeated PN News to retain the WCW World Television Championship. Poor Austin. Oh, uh, yeah. Poor, poor, poor Austin. Uh, Dustin Rhodes and Ricky Steamboat defeated the Enforcers, Arn Anderson and Larry Zbysko, to win the WCW World Tag Team Championship. Rick Rude defeated Sting to win the WCW United States Championship. And in the main event, Lex Luger defeated Rick Steiner to retain the WCW World Heavyweight Championship. So I would say looking at that card, and you can always go back on the network to uh, see it, but I would maybe skip the first and last matches and uh, be entertained by the middle two matches right there because Dustin and Steamboat against the Enforcers, amazing, uh, at least on paper, it seems like an amazing matchup. I probably did watch uh, that Clash of the Champions because I remember that era with them with the titles. And Rude against uh, Sting? Mm Mm-hmm. Can't go wrong with those two matches there. No, again, WCW had a lot of good matches. Usually, though, it wasn't the main event. In the last, I'd say in the last seven years of of WCW, really the main events never were even close to what some of the lower card matches turned out to be. Oh, exactly. But enough about WCW, let's move on. 27 years ago in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, Chris Candido defeated Tracy Smothers in the finals of a one-night tournament to win the vacated NWA World Heavyweight Championship. Candido was the first NWA World Champion since Shane Douglas threw down the title way back on August 27th. Other participants in the tournament were Devon Storm, Eddie Gilbert, Johnny Gunn, Al Snow, Tony Anthony, Jerry Lawler, Osu- Osamu, uh, Nishimura, and Lou Perez. Quite the arraignment of uh, people there. Yes. And unfortunately, the gentlemen in the main event are no longer with us. No, no, they're not. Uh, 26 years ago, WWF presented Survivor Series 95. This was the first Survivor Series to not take place on Thanksgiving Eve or or Thanksgiving night. This was also the first pay-per-view event to feature the Spanish announce table. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. You were going to run down the card. uh... Well, that's okay. Was it a Spanish announce table, table joke? Because I'm sure their budget for tables went way up. Oh, of course. At that time. And they had like a target on them. Uh, right, the card, the Smoking Guns, Billy and Bart defeated the Public Enemy, Rocco Rock and Johnny Grunge, uh, Bertha Faye, AJ Kong, uh, Tomoko Wada Nanabe, and Lioness Asuka, just different Asuka, uh, defeated the London of Blaze, Ko- Kyoko uh, Enoi, uh, but not, it's a different spelling of Enoi, um, Saki, Hag- oh geez, who cares, and um, Asari. Uh, 4-3 in a Survivor Series match. This was the final WWF pay-per-view for Alundra uh, and all the other women, for that matter. Uh, Alundra, less than a month later, turned up on Nitro, and we all know what she did. Yeah, there was rumored that uh, um, they were going to do Aja Kong against uh, Alundra Blaze at the Royal Rumble, but as you just mentioned, they cleaned house, and everybody was sent back to where they came from. Yep. Goldust defeated Bam Bam Bigelow. This was Bam Bam's final WWF pay-per-view as he left for ECW following the show. Uh, the Dark Side, which was The Undertaker, Savio Vega, Fatu, and Henry Godwin defeated the Royals, which is just a shitty team, except for Hunter Hearst Helmsley was on there. And a future guy uh, named, uh, uh, future guy who at the time was Isaac Yankum. Uh, four zip in a Survivor Series match. Undertaker scored, scored all four decisions for the dark side, three by a pinfall and one by countout. Well, what I was going to point out uh, beforehand uh, was about that uh, team uh, matchup there because you had uh, Mabel on there who teamed with, uh, I believe, Hunter in another uh, Survivor Series and also I believe Kane was uh, together with them. 
Mm. Kane and Triple H ended up uh, later on being a team on in Survivor Series and uh, a couple of years later. But what stood out for me also with this is the fact you look at Undertaker's team, it looks like a band of misfits. You've got a Puerto Rican guy there. You have uh, a rapping Samoan and a hog farmer. What do they have in common with Undertaker? The key denominator was nothing at the p- point of time for a wrestling fan, but if you uh, are now aware of the Bone Street crew, BSK, all those members were BSK. Hmm. And so the BSK guys were all together. Uh, of course, you were missing uh, Phineas Godwin and uh, Godfather and Yoko, but the common denominator to be on Taker's team was their behind the scenes uh, relationship. And as I said, a fan watching it would be like, why are these guys even together? It didn't make sense until later on when you find out the behind the scenes stuff. Yeah. Some of those teams were, you know, they just didn't didn't make sense uh, unless you knew the background, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, the main event had Shawn Michaels, Ahmed Johnson, the British Bulldog. Uh, they all survived, and with Psycho Sid, though he uh, was eliminated, and they eliminated Yokozuna, Owen Hart, Razor Ramon, and Dean Douglas. Uh, and uh, well, I guess this was the main event. Bret Hart defeated Diesel in a no DQ match to win the WWF championship in ending Diesel's 358-day reign. Yeah, it was almost the start of a little bit of uh, an Attitude Era-ish. It gave Diesel another edge. Um, I think this is one of the first times that somebody got put through a table because uh, Diesel ended up powerbombing Bret Hart through it and stuff like that. And then I believe uh, there was either noticeably mouth swear words or it was a uh, finger uh, used uh, at the end uh, or both uh, during that uh, match after uh, Diesel had lost. I think it was definitely mouth uh, swearing and got away with it and it started that edge uh, of a little bit of attitude but it didn't last long because he ended up leaving for WCW. All right, moving on to 21 years ago, WWF, sorry. My apologies. I had one other uh, picture to put up with that one. Oh, sure, go ahead. Uh, Oh, no, it's for the next one. Sorry, my apologies. Carry on. All right, 21 years ago, it was Survivor Series 2000. Uh, Some of the matches, uh, the Radicals, uh, of course, being Chris Benoit, uh, Dean Malenko, Eddie Guerrero, and Perry Saturn, uh, they won their match with Benoit and Saturn being the um, two survivors. They defeated Billy Gunn, Road Dog, China, and K Quick four uh, two in the Survivor Series match. Now K Quick, uh, that was our truth. Ron that's, right. that's what I thought, but I couldn't remember his name. The uh, Rock defeated Rikishi. Kurt Angle uh, defeated the Undertaker to retain the WWF uh, Championship. And we had Steve Austin and Triple H uh, fight to a no contest in a no DQ match. Which is kind of weird because a no contest in a no DQ match. Uh, The match had to end because Stone Cold Steve Austin uh, lifts Triple H's car via forklift and drops it some 30 feet upside down with Triple H inside. And then the credits rolled. (laughs) Thanks for coming out, and we'll see you next time on Monday Night Raw. Yeah, uh, what a what always, always had to hook you for the next night. Oh, of course, to find out Triple H lived uh, through all that, and magically he did. Um, the one thing I wanted to point out with this one, uh, which I almost got confused with the other Survivor Series, was the somewhat notable uh, vision of Undertaker that night going against Kurt Angle, and I'll put it up on the screen. You see him not in his traditional look. He had his duster. He had a uh, spandex-looking singlet on top, but the pants. 
somehow he ended up losing his luggage in transit and didn't have all his gear. So hmm. somehow he ended up with his duster. Maybe he was wearing that while traveling. But the rest of the attire for that match was all borrowed. And notably, those lovely snakeskin-looking leather pants were borrowed from the Godfather. Wow, nice. To do that match, which totally didn't look like a regular Undertaker. And he could have maybe passed it as uh, the American badass Undertaker uh, at that time. But I don't think he was uh, doing that character yet. Yeah, no, I don't think he was. All righty, we've got going to Raw 20 years ago from Charlotte, North Carolina. The Vince McMahon Kiss My Ass Club was born. With R William Regal being the first uh, member to be ushered in, Shane and Stephanie McMahon were fired, and Ric Flair, woo, returned to the WWF after leaving the company in early 93 as half-owner of the WWF. Yeah, so this was just after the um, whole Survivor Series where winner-take-all deal happened, and... Vince was supposed to get all of uh, ECW, WCW, and stuff like that. Paul Heyman got fired. Uh, it was time for Jerry the King Lawler to return after his uh, disruption of walking out when his wife, the cat, got fired. So he, uh, Heyman got fired from being uh, commentating with JR. King got put back in his place. Out came uh, Ric Flair, who supposedly ended up getting the shares or the ownership uh or whatever that stephanie and shane had so instead of it going to uh vince they were uh i guess smart enough to sell it off to rick flair uh i guess not having confidence in the fact that they could have won survivor series and continued on and he took over Oh, I'm sure in reality they sold those sh shares as soon as their team lost and had that all planned in, had, in, rea in reality. Had somebody on speed dial making the deal, yeah. Yes. 15 years ago, TNA presented Genesis from the Impact Zone. Uh, Kurt Angle defeated Samoa Joe by submission. The submission is the first time Samoa Joe was beaten in a match in TNA. And you can catch that on TNA's uh, streaming service. Ooh, nice. And it would have been a happy 60th birthday to Miss Elizabeth. Uh, of course, you know, I have things written here. Um, how about you insult f f uh, uh, Lex Luger? <laughs> well, had she not started partying with him uh, and uh, hooking up with him after uh, during their time in WCW... Who knows where she would have been? I get relationship breakdown with uh, Randy over uh, his possessiveness, but she had uh, left, I guess, a real estate agent or whatever he was uh, when she was out of wrestling and hooked up with Lex. And we know the story, unfortunately, with that. And rest in peace, Elizabeth. Uh, everybody uh, our age, probably uh, one of their first... Uh, wrestling crushes for sure yeah i didn't i didn't have a crush on miss elizabeth i mean yes she's pretty and all that but i found her quite useless out there i was right there with jesse ventura it's like what what is she out there doing except for the odd time like at SummerSlam 88 or 89 whatever that was uh she really didn't do anything um anywho we're moving on to november 20th 31 years ago, NWA presented Clash of the Champions 13, Thanksgiving Thunder. Uh, this was the last Clash of the Champion uh, Champions under the uh, NWA banner. The main event saw Ric Flair defeat Butch Reed to earn a NWA World Tag Team Championship match for the Four Horsemen at Starcade. 28 years ago, WCW presented Battle Bowl, the concept used before in Starcade 91 and 92, uh, and was revived for St. Lambury in 1996. 
was that wrestlers would be randomly paired for one-off tag team matches via lethal lottery, with the winners advancing to an over-the-top battle royal, with the winner of the battle royal declared the winner of Battle Ball. This was the only Battle Ball pay-per-view in WCW history, as it was scrapped the next year. Uh, Vader uh, last eliminated Sting to win Battle Ball. I like the concept of Battle yeah. Ball. Um, especially if you can do it uh, on occasion, whether it's once a year, just like the Royal Rumble or uh, Survivor Series, wrestling needs some sort of variety. Not every show has to look the same. Um, and I like that idea. Uh, and especially in that environment, you could control how things are going. Because look right here, Fifi and Gene Orkland, who... It had a very cringeworthy and would never happen in uh, this time of uh, Me Too movements and stuff like that. Would not have those segments that they did with pulling the names because he was being like a dirty old man with the uh, young lady. Uh, but unless they showed it to the camera who was actually being drawn, you can rig that up properly. Oh, now... Yeah. They obviously didn't because you had some really bad combinations, which I get that was the concept of Battle to have people who would never team against each other. But then there were some obvious, oh, yeah, this was definitely uh, rigged when tag teams were against each uh, partners were against each other. And it was like, really? So they could have done a little bit better in creative wise. But the concept I like, uh, it's unique. And at the end, the battle bowl ring where hopefully somebody gets a title match and stuff like that. It's something to shake things up. Wrestling needs that. And who doesn't like a good battle Royal? Yes. Actually a lot of people, but <laughs> punch, punch, kick, kick, clothesline. Oof, over. Repeat. Well, you know, I, I will say that matches like that, I believe, are better nowadays because they actually try to do a little more moves in the ring where before, yeah, it's pretty much just punch, punch, kick, kick. Toss. Toss. Next. <laughs> 27 years ago in Tokyo, Japan, Bull Nakano defeated Lunder Blaze to win the WWF Women's Championship. The win would end a 342-day reign with the championship for Blaze, by far the longest run in the second incarnation of the women's championship. Well, it's easy to do that when you only have you know, yeah. hired the champion and a challenger, yep. as opposed to nowadays when you have 20 women to interchange. 21 years ago on Nitro from Augusta, Georgia, the perfect event, Chuck Palumbo and Sean Stasiak, defeated Alex Wright and Alex Skipper, uh, substituting for General Rection, he was not uh, erected that day, to win the WCW World Tag Team Championship. 19 years ago at an NWA TNA pay-per-view taping, Jeff Jarrett defeated Ron Killings to win the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. The match and the episode ended with the TNA on-screen debut of Vince Russo, who was the masked Mr. Wrestling 3. Shocking. Shocking. Hold back. Ten years ago, WWE presented Survivor Series. The hook of the show was never before and never again, pairing The Rock and John Cena together. This was Morrison's final pay-per-view match as he was released less than two weeks ago. But don't worry, years later he gets rehired. And, oh, fired. and then let go again. Um, CM Punk defeated Alberto Del Rio by submission to win the WWE Championship. WWE announcer Howard Finkel made a cameo appearance introducing Punk. This was the start of Punk's 434-day title uh, run as WWE Champion. John Cena and The Rock defeated the awesome truth, being The Miz and our truth Post-match, The Rock gave the rock bottom to Zena. Also, our truth was busted for violating the WWE's wellness policy just days before the event, but was not suspended until two days later. You know, they need to keep their main event alive. Absolutely. 
Nine years ago, Celeste Bonin, a.k.a. Caitlin, was arrested during the SmackDown taping in Grand Rapids, Michigan, for an outstanding warrant on an unpaid speeding ticket. Yeah, I couldn't doctor this photo to uh, change her to be behind the, that fence, but... <laughs> November 21st. 33 years ago, Ted Turner signs papers officially finalizing the deal between he and Jim Crockett Promotions. Shortly after, uh, Turner rebrands Crockett Promotions as a World Championship Wrestling, and of course, they would remain under the NWA banner until 1993. Yeah, they basically just rebranded themselves as their TV show name. Sort of like what uh, TNA did with rebranding themselves as Impact Wrestling, because yeah. that was the name of their TV show. Yes, yes, it was. And they're still not bad, Impact. I'd still go see their shows. Yep. 22 years ago, WCW presented Mayhem from the Air Canada Centre in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. 13,829 were in, in attendance, uh, with 200,000 homes watching on pay-per-view. Uh, and there's a note here, WCW would lose more than half of their pay-per-view audience in just three months. The hook of the show was the conclusion of a month-long tournament to crown a new WCW World Heavyweight Champion. And, and this pay-per-view was really one of their last good pay-per-views. Yeah, I was there for the, this one, and I had to put the picture of Kimberly there because she looked amazing that day uh, going against uh, David Flair. But I was uh, four uh, rows off the floor on the side where uh, I could see Bobby and uh, Tony and all them commentating. And so then the ramp was to my left. I had a perfect view and everything. Awesome uh, that way, except for the fact that Tony and uh, Bobby clearly did not care. Uh, and you could tell in their posture uh, at the table. I even set the uh, bought the pay-per-view as well and set a uh, record on my DVR. So when I went home and watched it, it was like a tale of two different shows. Um, as you said, it was a decent pay-per-view to watch live. But when I got home, because of the commentary, it took away from it. I'm just like, it was this the same show that I was just at and happy that I went to that event? It's unfortunate because, you know, they do say the commentating does give words to the action. And if your commentators are not into it at all because of personal things or being drunk, uh, God only knows. It's going to take away from the fans' enjoyment. And you can say all you want about WCW going downhill because of the merger with Turner and the buy uh, buyout of AO All Time Warner and stuff like that. But I think they would have been more uh, apt to keep it alive if the fans weren't turned away by all the stupid decisions, also, and was still generating money. You mentioned that they were losing about a third of their uh, audience over time. Yeah, like after this show, they, uh, what was it, in a three-month period, it said? Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, pretty much after the show, in three months, they lost like a big chunk of their audience. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I um, I don't know if you remember, I was there too. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh I remember seeing Bobby commentating and basically he didn't lift up his head most of the night. He had it down buried in the um, monitor the monitor, and it was like, wow, he just doesn't seem to want to be there. Yeah. And this was also a weekend when uh, WDE was, or WDF was uh, at the Sky Dome on the Saturday night and WCW on the Sunday night. We went to both shows and, uh, I believe WCW guys ended up backstage at uh, the WWF show just to see uh, some of the talent and we're hanging out together. I'm not sure if any WWF guys uh, did the same thing. Uh, depends on where they were needed on the Sunday. But, you know, people talk about the wrestling war. The wrestling war then and now is more about the corporation side of things and the fans get uh, – 
too entrenched in it to enjoy things. Meanwhile, everybody's out for each other. You know, they all want each other to flourish and succeed, regardless of what banner you wrestle under. And that's was then and now. Yeah, I think I think uh, uh, rivalry is good, but you also have to be. And let's look at major league sports. There's teams, and sure they'll fight one another and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, <laughs> they all have to make a living. Exactly. So it's it's you want to protect your fellow workers, and you know you're not trying to put the other guy out of business. And you see that, and you were saying uh, with other sports, you see that a lot with hockey and with uh, football because after hockey games, uh, especially if they're tournament uh, format and your uh, one team gets bumped out, you're fighting hard against each other. It's over. They do that whole lineup and shake hands. After a football game with the NFL, the after last play, all the teams get on uh, the field and are shaking each other's hands. Meanwhile, you just battered each other for the last 60 minutes. No, I know in wrestling, now I don't know if it's throughout wrestling, but I know a good chunk of wrestling. Um, once you're done your match, you're supposed to shake the other guy's hand that you just wrestled. Um, yeah, they do it a lot uh, backstage uh, more so, uh, unless it's Ring of Honor and they were doing it out front. But, well, yeah, yeah, this is, ba- th- this is backstage. I know, uh, I don't know about nowadays, but I know back in like, the older generation, that was a thing that you just did, whether you liked it or not. Yeah. Anywho, where we are, I think we're still on. Oh, yeah. So the card for that one, we saw Norman Smiley defeat Brian Nobbs to become the first WCW hardcore champion. Uh, that was an amusing match. Buff Bagwell defeated Kurt Henning in a retirement match. And, of course, to no surprise of no one, their retirement would not stick as Henning would be back about five months later. Bret Hart defeated Sting in a World Heavyweight Championship Tournament semifinal. Uh, Goldberg defeated Sid Vicious in an I Quit match, and Sid actually never quit. He passed out from a Goldberg clutch submission, uh, and he got a tons of cheers while Goldberg got the booze. And a lot of that, of course, was because... Bizarro Land! Yeah, Bizarro Land, and also the WWF was there the night before, and I'm sure a lot of those same people were at that show. Yep. And Bret Hart defeated Chris Benoit by submission to win the vacated WCW World Heavyweight Championship. Which was then presented by the Gretzky family. Oh, yeah. Neat. 21 years ago at a SmackDown taping, Billy Gunn defeated Eddie Guerrero to win the WWF Intercontinental Championship. 14 years ago, Harris Norris Jr., who worked as Hard Body Harrison in WCW, uh, the power plant guy, uh, was found guilty of sex trafficking and prostitution charges by a federal jury in Georgia. Uh, A little bit on the whole thing, he kept eight women as sex slaves in his two North Georgia homes. Harrison uh, was convicted of charges including aggravated sexual abuse, forced labor, sex trafficking, conspiracy, and witness uh, tampering. During a two-week trial, prosecutors portrayed Norris as a predator who used his wrestling business to lure poor and vulnerable women into prostitution and forced labor. Witnesses testified that Norris, a former army sergeant and veteran of the Persian Gulf War, imposed a strict military structure with each of the women assigned to a squad overseen by an enforcer. In addition to forcing the victims to work as prostitutes, Norris made them work in and around his houses, requiring them to haul trees, laid sod, in paint, according to testimony. Okay, the, the last part, even, you know, that's okay, uh, I guess. But, like, my God, you have them as prostitutes and you're making them do, like, yard work. Yikes. Yeah. That just what doesn't a, make sense. And it's kind of weird. What a piece of shit. So in April 2008, Harrison was sentenced to life in prison as this was a federal crime. Norris has no chance of parole. 
uh, there is no parole in the federal penal system. All right. 11 years ago, WWE presented Survivor Series, and that would have been 2010. Dolph Ziggler defeated Cabal to uh, retain the WWE Intercontinental Championship. This was Cabal's lone pay-per-view match as he would be released just before Christmas and back on his way to Mortal Kombat. Uh, Team Mysterio, uh, Ray Mysterio, Kofi Kingston, Chris Masters, and Big Show, oh, and MVP, defeated Team Del Rio. Mysterio and Big Show were the two survivors. And Natalia defeated Lay Cool uh, in a two-on-one handicap match to win the Divas Championship. November 22nd. 66 years ago in Tokyo, Japan, Rikin Dozen uh, defeated King Kong to become the first all-Asia heavyweight champion. Rikin Dozen uh, would hold his belt longer than the title reigns of San Martino and Vern Gagne. Only four men would hold the all-Asia heavyweight title. They would be uh, Kintero Oki. He held it for uh, four times. And Giant Baba and Bill Dromo. He seems to be a happy fellow there. Very happy. 37 years ago, NWA presented Starcade the Million Dollar Challenge. Some of the bigger matches on the card were NWA Mid-Atlantic Heavyweight Champion Ron Bass defeated Dick Slater by DQ. Ivan Koloff and Nikita Koloff defeated Ole Anderson and Keith Larson. Tolly Blanchard defeated Ricky Steamboat to retain the NWA World Television Championship and win 10,000 Smackaroos. And the main event had Ric Flair defeating Dusty Rhodes to retain the NWA belt and won a cool $1 million. And former boxing uh, world heavyweight champion Joe Frazier was the referee for that match. Yeah, for the NWA, this was definitely their WrestleMania. Um, Bischoff has said that he thought uh, that Halloween Havoc was more of the uh, uh, WrestleMania for WCW, so that was kind of a change between the two companies in that regards where the focus was taken. But yeah, definitely Starcade was their WrestleMania of the NWA. And they stacked their cards, especially with, as you see, um, $1 million and Joe Frazier and Mm -hmm. and uh, Dusty in the main event. Uh, 31 years ago, WWF presented Survivor Series from the Hartford Civic Center in Hartford, Connecticut. This event was the first look at The Undertaker, even though he was at a TV taping the day before. And the awful golly gooker. The show also included a one-in-a-kind main event, all the winners of their Survivor Series matches would face off in a grand finale match of survival. Team Warrior, Ultimate Warrior, and Hulk Hogan uh, were the lone survivors. And Tito Santana uh, was with them, defeating Team Ted DiBiase, which was, of course, DiBiase, Warlord, Paul Roma, Rick Martel, and Hercules. Uh, those last four guys were all winners uh, the, of the same team. And... Was it the Bushwhackers and no, no shit. I can't remember who they beat. Uh, the, uh, the visionaries ended up being the rockers, Jake Roberts and, uh, Jimmy Snuka. That it. was during the time when, uh, uh, Rick Martell had blinded Jake with the atomizer of, uh, it was full of arrogance. And this was the event that I mentioned that, uh, had all the warriors, uh, together, the modern day warrior, the road warriors, and uh, ultimate warrior together as a tag team, taking on uh, perfect and uh, demolition. All three, yeah, yes. yeah. You were mentioning uh, this was also uh, the debut of Undertaker with uh, Brother Love by his side, Bruce Pritchard, but uh, he'd appeared a couple days earlier on a, a TV taping as Kane, the Undertaker, and there's even an article in the WD Magazine, or WDF Magazine at the time, introducing him and called him Kane, the Undertaker. Yep. Magically, he that got dropped, and then we ended up with Kane, the Undertaker's brother. And Kane. Bruce Richard actually named one of his kids Kane. Wow. 
And he was uh, um, announced as Kane the Undertaker at this Survivor Series, but they've edited that out now. So, um, but uh, I had the recording for years off of uh, a satellite that a friend got me, and I, it said that's how uh, 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 I'm imagining that's why they named Kane Kane. Uh, yes, or, well, that was uh, Bruce Pritchard probably naming him because yeah. uh, Bruce was still behind the scenes. And then, of course, you got the Goblet Gooker, whose head has changed over the years, but this was Eddie Guerrero's brother, Hector Guerrero, uh, in the egg, and people thought it was going to end up being Mark Calloway coming out of the egg, and there was thought that uh, he was going to be uh, some sort of Eggman or Egghead uh, type deal, like how uh, Vincent Price was for... Uh, Batman yes. in the TV series, but thankfully neither of that happened, and we had Hector Guerrero come out of the egg instead, and Gene Orkelin doing the best he could to get through that segment and doing the hoedown with them. And yeah, I, I can yeah. only imagine what would have been had this gimmick gotten over at that event if they would have kept uh, the gobbledygooker somehow as a actual wrestler. Yeah. <laughs> Thankfully it bombed and they said, thank you, Hector, and we're not going to use you anymore. For Hector. 29 years ago in Tokyo, Japan, all tomorrow... Ultimo Dragon uh, defeated El Samurai uh, to win the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship. And on the same show, Scott Norton and Tony Helm uh, defeated the Steiner brothers to win the IWGP Tag Team Championship. Tony Helm, uh, who would go on to a small fame in the WWF as Lou, uh, Ludwig Borga. That would have been an interesting team, uh, Borga and Scott Norton, just because of their size and build. Mm -hmm. 23 years ago, WCW presented World War III. Bill Goldberg, the, re uh, the reigning WCW World Heavyweight Champion, was not booked for the event. This was also the final World War III event, as the concept would be abandoned the next year for mayhem. Mm -hmm. Kevin Nash last eliminated Scott Hall and Lex Luger in a 60-man three-ring battle royal to win a WCW World Heavyweight Championship match at Starcade. And hey, a lot of people don't like battle royals, so why do it just in one ring? And not two rings, but three rings. Yeah, uh, I, I did not like World War Three. It, it's one of those things where, you know what, if it's just on TV, it's not as bad. But if you, I'm sorry, if you're in the audience, that would have been just. The no, actually, I think I would have probably enjoyed this a little bit better as an audience member, because sitting there, you get to see all three rings. I didn't like the fact that they were offset the way they were. But you get to see all three rings uh, set up the, uh, the way they are and uh, watch the match as opposed to sitting at home where watching it on TV, they tried to triple split screen and all you had was a itty bitty square and you're trying to figure out who's doing what. Now the dumb concept also of this was that once one ring got down to a certain amount of people, you were supposed to just casually walk over to another <laughs> ring and start battling it out. They should have made it in a way, split the roster into uh, three rings of 20, and then, especially in this day with all the triple threat matches that we see nowadays, have a winner from each ring go against each other in a triple threat match. Yeah, and uh, yeah, those split screens were brutal. Uh, I have a picture coming up. Well, yeah, I would take that back then. I would rather see it live than on three split screens. Yeah, there's a photo coming up in one of the other uh, discussions we talked about uh, World War Three, where it's a screenshot of a triple split. So you'll get to see that, those who are watching uh, this going on. Moving along. 12 years ago, WWE presented Survivor Series 2009. The Undertaker defeated Big Show and Chris Jericho in a triple threat match to retain the World Heavyweight Championship. And John Zena defeated Triple H and Shawn Michaels in a triple threat match to retain the WWE Championship. 
11 years ago on Raw from Orlando, Florida. Um, this was the debut of the Angry Miz Girl. Randy Orton defeated Wade Barrett to retain the WWE Championship. Post-match, Orton was beaten down by Nexus. Unfortunately, his night wasn't over. Just moments later, The Miz elected to use his Money in the Bank briefcase for a guaranteed WWE Championship match. Moments later, The Miz defeated Randy Orton to win the WWE Championship. The angry Miz girl who would win a Slammy, and uh, of course it was taken by uh, taken from her by The Miz live on TV. And that little lady is now 20. Yeah, she even was on Raw for the Slammies and got her award. And then uh, Miz took it. What a jerk. Two, uh, six years ago was the 25th uh, Survivor Series. Uh, the Brothers of Destruction, the uh, Undertaker and Kane defeated the Wyatt family. Uh, Bray and Luke Harper. And that was about all on that one as far as uh, worth mentioning. Nothing changed hands on that show. Um, you have anything to add about that show? Yeah, no. Uh, well, you had uh, the world title uh, on the line with uh, Dean Ambrose and uh, Roman Reigns. I think, if I recall right, this is the night where all three uh, members of the shield would end up holding the belt in one night. Cause I think uh, Seth Rollins had the uh, briefcase or something. Somebody had a briefcase uh, that got cashed in. There was an event where one went in with the title and I think it was this event. One went in with the title, lost it and then lost uh, the other one, lost it to a uh, uh, money in the bank uh, cash in. So, and all three members of uh, the Shield would end up holding the title that night. Hmm. All right, then. November 23rd, 40 years ago in New York City, Pedro Morales defeated the magnificent Don Morocco to become the first two time WWF Intercontinental Champion. 32 years ago today, WWF presented Survivor Series 89 from the Rosemont Horizon in Rosemont, Illinois. This was the first Survivor Series event to feature four-on-four -four matches instead of the five-on-five -five the first year. The King's Court being Randy Savage, Canadian Earthquake, Dino Bravo, and Greg Valentine. The only one eliminated on that team was Valentine. They defeated the 4 by 4s uh, Jim Duggan, Bret Hart, Ronnie Garvin, and Hercules. Kind of an odd team there. Uh, I can understand Jim Duggan and Hercules kind of being together, but Bret Hart uh, and Bret Hart and Ronnie being together, but... Yeah, it was just <laughs> weird. Uh, the Hulkamaniacs, uh, Hulk Hogan, Demolition, and Jake Roberts... Uh, Hogan was the only one that survived this one, uh, defeated the Million Dollar Team, being Ted DiBiase, Powers of Pain, and Zeus. 27 Still years. just promoting No Holds Barred, and unfortunately, Tiny Lister did not have any right being in the position uh, with how green he was. He was greener than Ted DiBiase's money. Yes, but... Honestly, I thought he did a f f fine job because he's an actor and he looked mean. He played the part. It's just, yeah, he's not going to, you know, he's not going to do a whole bunch because he's not really trained for that. But I, I, I personally, I personally loved his facial expressions. And when he did the neck uh, 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 twist to Hogan, always uh, uh, Hogan always sold that quite well. True. And, of course, you'd see this all again in WCW a few years later. 27 years ago, WWF presented Survivor Series 94 from the Freeman Coliseum in San Antonio, Texas. This was the last WWF pay-per-view to take place on a Wednesday night. Beginning with the 95 Royal Rumble, all the regular pay-per-views would move to Sundays. Uh, we had the royal family being Jerry Lawler and the midgets, uh, sleazy, queasy, and cheesy. God, this was terrible. Uh, and they defeated Clowns R Us, being Doink the Clown, Dink Pink, and Wink. 
Bob Backlund defeated Bret Hart in a submission match to win the WWF Championship. This match had Owen Hart convince his mother to throw in the towel. Helen was a good mom and saved yep. her son. Yep, she was a good mom. And, and, and as far as I remember, this was a good match. Uh, Bob Backlund was odd the way he walked and all that stuff and was a little bit batshit crazy. At least that's how he was portrayed. But damn, he was uh, he was a pretty damn good wrestler, especially him and Brett always seemed to have really good matches. Yeah, and they did the title change so that a couple of days later, uh, Diesel could get the uh, belt from Bob uh, in eight seconds. Yeah, and that was terrible. Absolutely awful. In Madison Square Gardens. It, it's it's fine that he won, and it's fine that it was quick, but it shouldn't have been that quick. Uh, the Undertaker defeated Yokozuna in a casket match, and Chuck Norris was the special enforcer. Chuck Norris, hell yeah, the 90s. Mm -mm. Well, the last time Yoko and him went against each other at the Royal Rumble, uh, the, he was outnumbered, Undertaker was. So this time he uh, brought in T Walker, Texas Ranger, and uh, uh, Jarrett took quite the uh, karate kick from uh, Chuck. He, yep, he sure did. Uh, 27 years ago, Arthur Leon Art Barr was found dead in his home in Springfield, Oregon. He was just 28. He was born October 8th, 1966 in Portland, Oregon. Barr was a second-generation wrestler. Art became friends with Roddy Roddy Piper while Piper was on the Northwest Independent Circuit. And we covered him only, um, well, back in October. Uh, uh, so I'm not going to go through uh, his whole thing again, if you want to hear that. Um, he was born on October 8th, so just look for the October 8th week. 24 years ago, WCW presented World War III uh, from the Palace of Auburn Hills. Uh, Kurt Henning defeated Ric Flair to retain the WCW United States Heavyweight Championship. Scott Hall won the 60-man three-ring battle royal, last eliminating the Giant to win a shot at the WCW World Heavyweight Championship. And Kevin Nash, disguised as Sting, uh, descended from the rafters with a baseball bat, causing Hogan to eliminate himself. Sting then attacked and eliminated the Giant to give Hall a shot at the WCW World Heavyweight Championship at Uncensored 98. All right, 14 years ago, Linda Hogan announces that she had filed for divorce from Terry Bollea, or Berlia, sorry, uh, aka Hulk Hogan, after 24 years of marriage. Shortly after filing for divorce, Linda, who was 48 at the time, briefly dated a 19 year old who went to the same high school as their children, Nick and Brooke. Awkward. Linda would reveal about a year later that the decision to file for divorce came from Hogan's alleged affair with a woman who worked on Brooke Hogan's album in 2006. The series Hogan Knows Best was canceled shortly after the announcement. Linda got about 70% ownership of the couple's liquid assets, 40% ownership of Hogan's companies, and a $3 million property settlement, totaling over $7.4 million. But of course, Hulk Hogan would wind up with about uh, three million, and don't feel sorry for him because he got Gawker money soon after, and that Gawker money was more than he ever made in his lifetime. And then he went back to Vince and got more money. So absolutely. Uh, Thirteen years ago, WWE presented Survivor Series two thousand and eight. Uh, besides the three Survivor Series elimination matches, uh, The Undertaker defeated Big Show in a casket match. Edge defeated Triple H and Vladimir Kozlov in a triple threat match to win the WWE Championship. Wow, Vladimir Kozlov was in that match. I wasn't really watching uh, uh, wrestling at this time. Uh, and John Cena defeated Chris Jericho to win the World Heavyweight Championship. A decent card. Yeah, yeah. Actually, the um, uh, I bet you that was a big casket they had for Big Slow. Oh, yeah. Twelve years ago, Jesse the Body Ventura guest hosts Raw. In the featured bout, Sheamus won a breakthrough battle royal to win his first shot at the WWE Championship. And, of course, uh, Jesse uh, the Body Ventura reunited with Vince, with Vince McMahon at the commentary table. And they pretty much sounded... Uh, as they did many, many moons ago. 
didn't miss a step. And uh, they need to do more breakthrough uh, battle royals or stuff like that because, you know, at least shakes up for even one night, allowing somebody different to be in a main event uh, spot. Uh, and hopefully it's not done like they did this past Monday where Austin Theory stole a egg and was awarded a title match. Don't ask. Okay. I will not. 11 years ago, the Philadelphia Spectrum was torn down. The building hosted many WWF events from 74 to 96, but would remain open until 2009. The building hosted two WWF pay-per-view events, SummerSlam in 1990 and King of the Ring in 95. It was hosted six Stanley Cups, four NBA Finals, two Final Fours, that being basketball, and numerous concerts. Pearl Jam was the last public act in the building with their final concert on Halloween 2009, lasting more than three and a half hours. And now it's a beautiful parking lot. Yes, it's a beautiful parking lot now. Yeah, a lot of those buildings. In fact, there's a few buildings in this uh, week that are no longer around. The Palace of Auburn Hills, and there was another one. uh, I can't remember which one it was, but it came up, too, that I think is gone. Yeah, the Palace is gone. Yes. And that wasn't too long ago, maybe a year ago. Yeah. November 24th, 38 years ago, NWA, in association with Jim Crockett Promotions, presented Starcade, a flair for the gold. Uh, from the Greensboro Coliseum in Greensboro, North Carolina. And I think that's gone too, isn't it? Yeah, possibly. That wouldn't surprise me. Uh, we got Charlie Brown uh, defeated the great Kabuki in a title versus mask match to win the NWA World Television Championship. Roddy Piper defeated NWA United States champion Greg Valentine in a non-title dog collar match. And, of course, that was a brutal match uh, with uh, Roddy Piper lo- losing some hearing in one of his ears. Jay Youngblood, and, uh, bleh, Jay Youngblood and Ricky Steamboat defeated the Briscoe brothers, Jack and Jerry Briscoe, to win the NWA World Tag Team Championship. Angelo Mosca was the special referee. And the main event had Ric Flair defeat Harley Race in a steel cage match to win the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. And Gene Kaniski was the special referee for that tilt. And they didn't telegraph that one, considering they called it a flare for the gold. Flare for the gold. Woo! 33 years ago, WWF presented Survivor Series 88. The Powers of Pain, the Warlord and Barbarian, were the surviving team as they joined Mr. Fuji in that one. Uh, It was kind of uh, uh, unique as one team went good and one team went bad in the same match. But the good team was awarded the uh, victory, even though the Powers of Pain went heel. Yeah. And we had the Mega Powers, Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage. Uh, were the survivors for their team, including Hercules, Coco Beware, and Hillbilly Jim, uh, defeating the Twin Towers, being Big Boss Man, Anna Keem, the African Dream, uh, King Haku, and Ted DiBiase, and the Red Rooster 5-3 in a Survivor Series match. And it was another moment of Hogan lusting after Elizabeth yep. that Randy Savage caught mm-hmm. and had video proof of. Because I believe I believe Hogan picked her up and spun her around, happy that they had won uh, their Survivor Series match. And, and he Randy gave the gave, luck. Randy gave him the stink eye. Yeah. What you doing, brother? Well, I'd give him the stink eye, too. 33 years ago in Carolina, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, Ron Garvin defeated Carlos Colon to win the vacated WWC Universal Heavyweight Championship. And hey, why not another Survivor Series? 28 years ago, it was Survivor Series 93 from the Boston Garden. Marty Jannetty and the 123 Kid were the sole survivors in their match. Uh, the Hart family, Brett, Bruce, and Keith all survived, uh, defeating Bre- uh, Shawn Michaels and his Knights. But poor Owen Hart, he didn't make it in this one, and he was betrayed by his family, which I totally agree. I totally agree. They could have done without Ray Combs in this show because that that just totally was a 
uh, Turner. I liked uh, Ray Combs uh, as part of the Family Feud, but he was just a duck out of water in this uh, whole thing and didn't his jokes did not fall anywhere near where they should have been. It was just a train wreck having Ray Combs there. Brett looked odd in a uh, singlet that uh, was pink instead of his uh, trunks, uh, like his tights that he would always have. Having the firefighter and the uh, teacher as the tag team partners. And I believe I recall that uh, Bruce, of course, because he always won the spotlight on him, was wanting to be the guy to turn on Brett. But mm. Brett didn't see that as being any payoff. And they yeah. went with they went with Owen, and we know what happened with that. Uh, this also started early eliminations even before the pay per view happened because if you see the poster for the main event, Tatanka was supposed to be part of that with the Steiners and Lex Luger, but then they ended Tatanka's undefeated streak with Borga getting a victory with one finger on him and being eliminated before the pay-per-view. So Undertaker stepped in and had uh, uh, the American flag inside his uh, duster. Over on the other side, I believe uh, Pierre, a.k.a. PCO, got eliminated. So Crush took over his spot all before the actual event. Meanwhile, they made up these lovely posters mm. of the main event. Oops. All right, we're going to go to 25 years ago, WCW presented another World War III. Chris Jericho defeated Nick Patrick. Uh, Jericho had one arm tied behind his back during the match. And the Giant won a three-ring 60-man battle royal last eliminating Lex Luger to win a future WCW World Heavyweight Championship match. 24 years ago on Raw is War. The New Age Outlaws, uh, Road Dog Jesse James and Badass Billy Gunn, defeated the Legion of Doom to win the WWF Tag Team Championship. This was their first tag belts, uh, uh, tag belt win as a team, and was the birth of the Outlaws because of what JR likened them as Outlaws leaving a robbery to a waiting car outside. And these were two guys that were going nowhere fast when Double J, Jesse James, and Rockabilly, managed by the Honky Tonk Man, were floating in obscurity and mm -hmm. fighting each other that they decided to team up, and the rest is history. And you got Billy Gunn, who's almost uh, 60, still active with his sons over in AEW with the Gun Club. The Gun Club. And it is amusing because Taz just rips strips off of Billy Gunn while he's wrestling. Yep. Um, it's a happy 41st birthday to Elizabeth Kosinski, Kosinski or something like that. Uh, of course, she is best known as the Glamazon Beth Phoenix, who is, of course, married to Edge. And uh, today she's married to Alan Copeland, a.k.a. Edge. The couple have two daughters together. And, of course, she is a 2017 Hall of Famer. And if uh, those watching uh, the visual part here, I have a split screen with what Beth looked like when she started wrestling and what she looks like uh, today uh, showing off her Hall of Fame ring. But those who are watching can see on the left-hand side of the screen that she was learning from Ron Hutchinson and uh, performed with Apocalypse Wrestling Federation here in Canada, um, Adam Copeland, Jay Russo, and Trish Stratus, and Gail Kim all came from Apocalypse as well. I'm just not sure about the timing, as I said, I think, on another show, whether or not Adam and Beth were both in Apocalypse at the same time and knew each other from then, and eventually, after a bunch of failed marriages and relationships, came together and have this wonderful family that they have together with their daughters. So it'd be interesting to find out if uh, their history goes back to here in Canada, in Toronto, uh, with Apocalypse. All right. Well said. And this is the November 25th. 36 years ago in New York City, the fabulous Moolah 
62 at the time, disguised as the Spider Lady, defeated Wendy Richter to win the WWF Women's Championship. Some view this as the original screw job, as Richter was the second most popular WWF wrestler and wanted a bigger paycheck. The WWF, the WWF at the time said screw that and screwed Richter, even though she kicked out when pinned by the Spider Lady and was banished until uh, 2010 when she accepted her place in the WWE Hall of Fame. Yeah, and after the victory, uh, Mula took off the mask and revealed who it was. And once again, the shadiness of Mula, which you can find out on Dark Side of the Ring. Yeah, I haven't watched that one yet. 29 years ago, WWF presented another Survivor Series. This one was 1992. There was just one elimination match on the show, unlike previous years, and really changed the feel of Survivor Series. It started to become a regular pay-per-view with the same old blah. Boo. Yep. Uh, this one does, of course, have the um, uh, infamous Yokozuna destroying Virgil match. It is quite entertaining. Squish. Uh, yep. The Nasty Boys, Brian Nobbs and Jerry Sags, uh, with the Natural Disasters, uh, who did not survive. Uh, um, Brian Nobbs and Jerry Seggs did uh, survive that, defeating Money Inc. being Ted DiBiase, IRS, and the Ber Beverly Brothers. Do, 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 do. And The Undertaker defeated Kamala in a coffin match, and Bret Hart defeated Shawn Michaels by submission to retain the WWF Championship. Yeah, this was originally supposed to be the Mega Maniacs, uh, or the Ultimate Maniacs, should I say, uh, mm -hmm. Warrior and Savage going against Flair and Ramon uh, as a follow-up from SummerSlam 92 in Wembley. And then all of a sudden, once again, Warrior just disappeared and started no-showing and got fired. And they had to make a quick swerve. And I guess they ended up finding out that Kurt Hennig could uh, get back in the ring. They turned him face on an episode of uh, All American Wrestling or TNT, whichever episode it was. I think it was All American. Um, and as you see in the upper right hand corner, the conversation was had and Savage uh, selected Perfect as his uh, new partner when then got Perfect got insulted by uh, Ramon and Flair, which then made Perfect want to team with Savage even more. And Bobby Heenan got angry and in Perfect's face as well, which set Mr. Perfect on a run of a fan favorite in WWF. And, of course, we also saw at uh, Saturday Night's main event, uh, Shawn Michaels defeat Bulldog for the Intercontinental title. He was already scheduled to be uh, in a match against Bret Hart for the world title. And this had champion versus champion. And just to know that their history – of a couple of years later against each other again for the world title. You know, their paths crossed so many times and mirrored each other. And yeah. Brett ended up getting the victory and a visit from Santa Claus. Yay. And in closing on that pay-per-view, I think it was a blessing that Warrior uh, did some no-shows because I think Perfect – is much better to watch than Warrior, and I think that match was a hell of a lot better. Oh, yeah, it probably was yeah, going to be a lot. Savage probably would have been carrying the bulk of it had uh, Warrior still been there. Yep. Uh, six years ago today, Tyler Klutz, best known to wrestling fans as Brad Maddox, was fired from the WWE. Pardon me. Uh, the reason for his firing, according to PWI Insider, before a dark match against R-Truth at a SmackDown taping, he used the line cocky bricks in a promo. On the main roster, he um, was best known as the referee that cost a ride back a Hell in the Cell match against CM Punk for the WWE Championship back in October 2012. And he had a brief stint as Raw General Manager in 2013 and 14. And, of course, just after his release, he went a little bit viral thanks to Paige, where adults, you can look that up, children don't. Ooh, yeah. But, yeah, he went a little bit viral on that one uh, involving Paige and also Xavier Woods was in 
LinkedIn, all that whole thing too. But yeah, who knows? He could have been talented. He stayed a lot of time in FCW and a little bit in NXT before being brought up. And unfortunately, like a lot of guys who make it from NXT, don't get understood on the main roster and oh, crash and burn. Yep. Well, he, he did take one heck of a great bump uh, in that Hell in the Cell match. Yep. And it, it would have been a happy 75th birthday for John L. Sullivan, a.k.a. Johnny Valiant. He died in April. Uh, sorry, he died back in April 2018. He was born in Pittsburgh. Uh, he grew up with and became friends with Bruno San Martino. And Sullivan began his career in the Detroit wrestling territory with the Sheik. And I am going to cut that short um, and go to his retirement. Uh, once he retired from wrestling, he became a comedian and actor, having appeared on multiple episodes of The Sopranos and Law and & Order. He has had um, uh, some cameo appearances in the 2008 film The Wrestler. Or sorry, shouldn't have said appearances, whatever. And he is a member of the WWE Hall of Fame class of 96. And that is it for this week in wrestling history. Of course, it's compiled from the vast land of Google, Wikipedia, cagesideseats.com, and most importantly, from fans and journalists that had front row seats to history. And as always, a big thank you to our uh, sponsor, CoolBet. CoolBet.com and sports book betting uh, and casino games. Stay cool and bet responsibly. And of yeah, course, thanks to our genres listeners as well. Exactly. Yeah. So everywhere you're uh, starting this, Whoops. oh, blooper. Uh, anyways, <laughs> thank you for uh, compiling that. We have a couple more weeks in this format and we'll go forward from there. Uh, I want to thank you for doing that. And we're going to uh, sign off. But thank you for joining us on Stitcher, Spotify, iHeartRadio, anywhere you get your podcasts from, watching us on YouTube or Facebook. And, of course, down below is how you can get in touch with us, scumbagswrestling.ca, scumbagswrestling at gmail.com, and, of course, on Facebook. So uh, thank everybody for being a part of this. Reach out to us if you have ideas. We'll uh, definitely take them under consideration for our revamp. And we want this show to be interactive. So thank you. And we'll see you next time. Toodles. <laughs>